Business Brain, the show for entrepreneurs, episode 409 for Wednesday, December 7th, 2022. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to, welcome back to Business Brain, the show by, for, and about entrepreneurs, the Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we use our business brains in all aspects of our lives, every single week, sponsors for this episode include Shopify.com slash SBS. That's where you can go to get your 14-day trial and full access to Shopify's entire suite of features, as well as Bambi at Bambi.com, where you can go and get your dedicated HR manager. We'll have some uh, more details to share about both of those, as well as a promo code for, for, uh, for both of them in a little bit here for now. Back here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And in Lafayette, California, I'm Shannon Jean. I'm excited to be here. Those are my two favorite sponsors today. I, I Well, they're today they're my two favorite sponsors. That's yeah, correct. That's yeah, right. they're awesome. Yeah. Super, ap- super applicable to yes. what we talk about here every week on Business Brain. Absolutely. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a great fit. It's no wonder they keep coming back. I'm, I'm glad yeah. they keep coming back. I don't mean to say that egotistically, but it's a, it is a good fit. I'm glad they agree that it's a good fit. Yeah, it's good. I agree with their agreement. Um, we got, we've got a couple of emails here. We got one from Mike that, uh, that, that sort of rang true with me when I was going through it this morning. I just got back from a trip to New York where I, I lots of great things happened. We were just there for a couple of days to celebrate my son's birthday with him. And, uh, but I, I will share one of these anecdotes, but it, it relates to Mike because see the business brain is always working, uh, Mike writes, he says, I just uh, finished listening to episode 406 on increasing engagement and will obey your command and send in a note to feedback at businessbrain.show. He says he is a longtime intermittent listener and second time emailer from Western Canada. He says the conversational nature of the show as a general format is what keeps me coming back. I particularly enjoy your perspectives and ways of looking at things when you relate a story from your past while responding to a listener question. It's always interesting stuff. I don't currently run a small business, Mike says, but I have run a couple in the past and my family has been running a small business for 40 years. So my head is often in that mindset. Many of your discussions fall into a zone where the lessons learned also inspire ideas for side projects. My current side project is a YouTube channel that may or may not become an income stream. Time will tell. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the journey of a hobby turning into a side hustle and then a primary gig. Pros and cons such as hobby skills versus business skills and losing the love of the hobby as it becomes an obligation. Looking forward to whatever comes down the pipe next. Well, Mike, good news. You are right here with us. Um, It's it's uh, this is an interesting one. It it, this perspective is opens up a lot of thoughts for me um, because, you know, what he discussed, the idea of the evolving hobby is uh, is something I've done a couple of times and there's often what I, what I think of as this moment of intention when I find myself deciding to do something business-like with my hobby, but perhaps as simple as just tracking expenses and income, right? Like, Oh wait, this might be tax deductible. It's usually driven by that to be, you know, to be honest, it's, I, right. It's like, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. I'm actively participating in this. It's costing me money and I'm earning something. And so it has to be sort of those three things happening simultaneously that I, that make me start to do the thing that begins that conversion from simple hobby to business. And I, I've been fortunate enough to notice this and do it a few times in my life, right? My, you know, my whole computing computer consulting career that led to a lot of other things that I do certainly was that way. My musical life uh, certainly has been that way. And I've, I've had other things as well, but when I, and it's happened enough to me and been good enough to me that when I see friends in this position, I will often, even in an unsolicited fashion, offer advice about, hey, you know, you're doing this thing, you're making a little bit of money from it, you know, you're making these little coasters or whatever, and you sold them to somebody, well, you should just write that off so you can at least get 
you know, the money back for the parts for the, the stuff that you're, uh, you know, you can lose money for f- up to five years. At least that was the rule back then. I don't know what it is now. Check with your accountant. But, y- you know, it's like, why not take the tax deduction? And and just just that. Right. You know, don't don't even worry about marketing it or anything. Just take the tax deduction. It's, it's right there for you. You know, I don't make the rules. They do. But, you know, follow them. And I'll get this resistance sometimes, not all the time, you know, that's along the lines of, well, if I treat my hobby like a business, then it will taint my beloved hobby to which I, of course, tell them they're right because they're my friends and I don't want to upset yeah. them. But internally, I'm thinking, yeah, except that if you actually succeed at turning your hobby into a job, then you'll have a job doing something you love. And you, that, I don't, that could be the case. Yes, I don't see I that. Right. It's not, it's not a guarantee that that's what's going to happen, but it's definitely not going to happen if you artificially limit that evolution. And that's just one of those things that makes me scratch my head, man. Like, it's not how I think I use my business brain all the time. It's why we do a show called business brain. So I, but, it, and I don't, I don't, I, I don't mean this to be judgmental, but it is judgmental, but it's morely more judgmental about me. Like I, I, it just doesn't make sense to me why you wouldn't want to take advantage of that. But I understand that some people choose not to. And so like, like I said, because they're my friends, I, I back off, but yeah. Yeah. But I, my take on it is a little different. Um, I've done this as well. You know, I, I love to fish. I imagined. Uh, yeah. So I bought a, a cabin on a river and I turned that into a business so <laughs> I could go up there and stay there and fish. And I have to go up to maintain it and take care of it. So those are all expenses that now I get to write off. Yeah. And if I do a little fishing every, every time I go up, that's, you know, that's okay. Um, yeah. You're and, allowed and to have other- fun and, and yeah. you're also allowed to do quote unquote non-business things on Correct. an otherwise valid uh, on a valid business trip. I don't want to say otherwise yeah. valid business trip. Like, you know, you don't have to be working 24 right. seven for a trip to be considered a business trip by the IRS. In fact, not even yeah. close certain things. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um, the, the a couple of things, I want to talk about the, the, uh, tainting your hobby kind of thing, but, or the, your feelings towards it. But first, um, my take on the hobby aspect is, uh, and thinking about turning it into a business, that's awesome. And that's that's exactly, or just a great example of using your business brain because you're even just considering it. It's like, wow, maybe I could make money at this. But my take on it is that it it's probably not going to work out exactly the way well, I know it won't. It, it won't <laughs> work out exactly the way you think it will. So you may not wind up making money at doing the hobby part of it, but maybe there's some ancillary thing that, that comes and gets involved in it that turns into a revenue stream. So, so that, that framework and that thought process is really important um, because it just gets you thinking and it opens up opportunities that, that may come along and connections that you may make. And you just never know where those, those things will lead. Um, You can uh, burn yourself out on something. And like I started, uh, uh, you know, my, one of my first companies because I loved Apple products. They changed my life with another business that I had. So I thought, wow, gosh, wouldn't it be great if I could actually create a company around this stuff? And I will say over the years, after dealing with uh, hundreds of thousands of Apple products, um, the 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 shine did wear off a bit, right? Because you kind of get step behind the velvet curtain, you learn everything about yeah. it. But but I still love working with the products, and I still respect what they are and how they empower my life. Um, yeah, the magic what goes I, away yes, sometimes for it, things a little bit. But yeah. that's gonna. Yeah. The reality is, it's gonna go like that's gonna evolve anyway. Yeah, anyway, yes. I, yeah, because yes. I'm the, I'm in the same boat. You know, I, Apple yep. and their products has very clearly been a driving force and informed my business decisions and and the businesses that I've had. And yeah, I I'm not usually enamored at. I don't usually find myself you know, it in awe of Apple's products, like I might have been initially, 
But, sure. I, you know, I mean, I have a, another business where I have a podcast that helps people with their Apple products. And I love that. I mean, it's great. Yeah. You know, so there's yes. other things about it that, you know, That's just right. leave they're, yourself they're, open to it and you, you can yeah, find things that you enjoy. Open. Yeah. Yeah. And what I found is that I doing this hobby thing as if, it, if the business does grow enough, there's a good chance you may wind up managing people that are doing your hobby. Yes. Right. It, it, or being involved in that. So um, if you can get interested in either managing people, management, learning and, and helping other people. Um, one of the biggest secrets to, to my success is that I focused a lot on helping other people be successful, um, whether they worked for me or not. You know, suppliers, I always tried to let the, they need to be successful and make money on me, so on and so forth. But I also love the deal aspect. And I didn't know that when I was younger until I started doing it. And sure. that's how that, that was another ancillary thing. So it'll be different, but it doesn't have to, you know, it won't be, it doesn't have to be ruined. It's right? not going to be bad. Yeah. 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 It'll be, it'll be great. I, I uh, run into and, people. And, go ahead. Sorry. Well, what I was going to say is the, we, th we're all about thinking differently on this show, mm -hmm. not thinking like a normal person that just goes to work every day. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, Mike's thought process, um, don't take the way other people think about, oh, your hobby, you're going to run and, and let it uh, impact, you know, your your growth of your hobby business. Yeah. I, uh, I And for those of you that listen to my Gig Gab podcast for musicians, some of what I'm about to say will be an overlap uh, for this week's show. But I was really blown away. I was down in New York, uh, as I said, and I posted something online asking people's uh, advice on things to do while we were there. And, you know, if, and one of my friends, a guitar player that I played uh, up here in New Hampshire with in a bunch of theater pits commented, he's like, you know, uh, your friend Andy, him, my friend Andy, uh, has staff rate tickets to Wicked. He's, you know, the, the show on Broadway because oh. he's the, he's, he plays guitar in Wicked. And I'm going to explain that. He's like, you should. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. You should, uh, you should ask me and, and I sure. can get you tickets and, and then you can go for, for cheap. So we did, we wound up doing that. Um, I knew Andy, or I met Andy, um, I don't know, maybe about five years ago, six years ago, we did a bunch of theater shows together. And he, while he was here, he was really trying to piece together a career for himself as a theater pit musician. And it just seemed like I could, he was frustrated because in his mind, he knew that this was possible to be like a stable, lucrative thing. And it seemed preposterous to me. I, 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 you know, I know what theater musicians make cause I am one, you, you know, you make somewhere between $50 and $150 a service, a service being either a rehearsal or a performance. And you know, it's hard to piece that together into something that can pay your mortgage and put food on the table. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he was, you know, he was driven on this. Now he had been in New York before and he told me that he had subbed uh, on Broadway for rock of ages, the musical, uh, you know, uh, that was made after the movie. And I was like, yeah, okay. But I mean, you're just a sub, whatever. Like I sort of dismissed that. And then this time around, I, I went down there and he is thriving, right? Like he's making a ton of money. Um, and he, yeah. And, and I'm like, oh, so you, you, you know, you're, you're, that's amazing. You're the guitar player. He's like, well, I'm actually not the chairholder chairholder being the person named in the program that is on the contract to play the guitar every night for the theater oh, show. Okay. He says, I'm his sub, I'm his primary sub. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Like you're thriving and surviving here as a sub. And he's like, oh yeah. He, he, and he explained this whole thing to me. And if you want like more of the details, uh, feel free to listen to gig gab from this week uh, because I, I, I went into it, but in essence, it takes a long time to find an opportunity where you can earn your spot as the, the chair holder of one of these uh, theater pit jobs, right? Because it's stable. Gig, it's a stable gig. There's eight performances a week. Depending on how it all works, it's all union rates, but depending on how many instruments you are asked to play, you actually wind up making more. And then you make even more if you're, if you need to be on stage, cause you get like a, a, a stipend for 
or an add-on. They call them doubles, but you don't get double. Uh, but, you know, a, a double for being on stage, for costuming, for choreography, like all these things add up. And, you know, you, sure. you, can, you can walk away post-tax with somewhere between 250 and 500 bucks a performance. Post-tax. You do that great. six times a week. Now, you know, like there's there's money to be made here. And how so, many hours of work is that? Well, it depends. He he was telling me about one show where because the band was on stage and this, that, and the other thing, it was a one act show, which means there was no intermission, a hundred minutes long. So let's say he was there for two hours, maybe a little more than two hours, you know, sure. like get costume and all that stuff. And he was post tax walking out with 500 bucks. That's cool. Yeah. 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 That's a good. Gig. It's a good, good gig. gig. And he's doing something he loves. Like it's, this is definitely yeah, yeah, a hobby great. turn. And then he could, he has all day to hang out with his family. Like, you know, he can, he can be the one that takes his kid to school and classes, you know, yeah, if his priceless. partner's working, like all of these things and, and he's thriving. And it was like, I told him like, now I understand why you were frustrated here in New Hampshire. Cause you knew what this, I, like I had no concept that you could like literally thrive as a sub. And he told me, he's like, well, some subs make more than the principal, the chairholder, because you are able to do more than it. You know, if you can sub on enough shows, you can probably get in 10 performances a week. Uh, you know, if you want to work every day and if you're hungry and that's what you need to do to, to you know, start, awesome. you start yeah. getting things rolling, like that's what you do. And and they have the because it's all union, they have a pension that they feed, which, of course, is why these shareholders hold on to their positions uh, oh, as yeah. long as they do. They, in fact, at this point, yeah, he says the guy who holds the chair only wants he, but the union says he has to play 51 percent of the shows every quarter. So he does. Oh, and wow. that's it. But he's fueling his pension. Right. It's this whole other world that. It like none of us would have known about if somebody didn't decide, Hey, I'm willing to take my hobby and turn it into something that could make money. Right. And now it's like his primary gig. And, and I mean, obviously he's a talented guitar player. I, I suppose that goes without saying he can read music. He, you know, he can play pretty much anything you throw in front of him. I mean, all of those things are sort of, you know, uh, table stakes to have a gig like that. But, um, but that's not that, I don't want to dismiss. That. I mean, it, it's doable. Yeah. Like you can, if you put in yes. the time, you can develop the skills and you can do it. Right. So, and there's a huge, I mean, if, if you can, I don't know how that type of, uh, uh, business relationship works, but if you can actually run it like a business and yeah. if you can get paid and form a, you know, a, a, a become a solopreneur, there's a ton of other benefits. And, Yes. If if you take away one thing from this conversation about hobby businesses is that it's not just about how much money you make or this kind of, there's just so many benefits that come to you, tax benefits and educational benefits. And just there's, there's a ton of great stuff that happens when you own a business. And as you get into it, you'll learn them more. You can go back and listen to other shows that we've done, um, so that mindset is really important, and that's a great way to use your business brain. You know, when we're running our businesses, our employees can create all kinds of interesting situations. What happens when an employee reports a serious issue like sexual harassment and you're not sure if you have a documented policy? We've got an answer for you because with our sponsor, Bambi, you get access to your own dedicated HR manager starting at just $99 per month. And your dedicated HR manager are available by phone, email, or and or real-time chat so that things like onboarding and terminations run smoothly, team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with all those changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you can automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. These HR managers, they're U.S.-based people dedicated to your business. So they have lots of them, of course, because Bambi is their own business. They serve many clients. But the one you get is dedicated to you, and it's the same one you get every time. So this gives you access to the HR expertise and personal touch that you and your business need. And look, you could go hire your own HR manager, but they cost like 80 grand a year. Bambi, like I said, starts at just $99 per month. 
You can schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. To do it, go to Bambi.com right now and type in small business under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help us here with the show. Spelled Bam, B-E-E dot com, Bambi dot com. Type in small business. You're going to be on your way. And our thanks to Bambi for sponsoring this episode. <laughs> There's that notification sound that I like, right? Notifications usually are uh, not something welcomed in our day. But that one is the sound of another sale on our sponsor, Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. And those notifications are the ones we really like. Shopify makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere. And with Shopify, you'll create an online store in your vibe, discover new customers, and grow the following that keeps those customers coming back. Shopify has all the sales channels sorted, so your business keeps growing from an in-person point-of-sale system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform, even across social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Shopify's got 24-7 support and free libraries full of educational content, which means that Shopify's got you every step of the way. And this is how and why every minute new sellers around the world make their first sale with Shopify. And you will too. Shannon and I, we've done it as well. You'll be joining us. We've used Shopify and various ventures in the past. It's amazing how simple it is because they've done the hard work of making the complex stuff simple. So they work on that. You work on what you do with your business. It's like a dream come true. When you're ready to launch your thing into the spotlight, do it with Shopify, the commerce platform backing millions of businesses down the street and around the globe. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash SBS, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash SBS to start selling online today. Shopify.com slash SBS. And our thanks to Shopify for sponsoring this episode. All right. We have a question that uh, has actually not made it into each ep of the most recent episodes. And so we're going to remedy that here it came from listener Jeff and it was part of a larger question, but he said uh, in, in response, like, like Mike to our request for more interaction. Uh, and part of that, he said, uh, you know, you talked recently about a business that you sold and we, we've both had businesses that we sold. Uh, so I think this is fair to sort of point to both of us. Although I, my guess is he was talking about me uh, just based oh, on the most know. recent, but you never know. Right. And he says, um, when you talked about it, what you talked about was extremely vague. Like, Hey, I got this buyer and we did our due diligence and you know what? Now I'm not part of that anymore. And here's how I feel about it. And he says, that's great. But the reality is how did you find the buyer? What were the steps you actually went through? Do you have a PDF of the bullet points of these things that you need to look out for? You know, what you're looking for in a buyer. What, these are the red flags that had me concerned, but ultimately we're okay. You know, those kinds of pragmatic things would be very interesting to those of us that run businesses. And Jeff, you are absolutely right. Now, part of the reason that I didn't go through that is I, I didn't think to, uh, to do some of it. The other part is that, it, Shannon and I actually did go through a lot of that stuff and have for each other several times over the years, but it's, it's a hard dance because this show isn't just me, Shannon and you, dear listener, having a conversation. <laughs> it, it, it is, it is, there, there are thousands of people listening and there are, there's confidentiality involved, uh, both for the buyer and for, for the, us as the sellers, and also any of the people who were involved and are involved in the business, not just the buyer, but, you know, employees and teammates and partners and all of those things. So it's a tough conversation to have, but I think we can have more of it than we than we certainly have, have had. And I I'm, think so I'm too. happy to talk through more of the Mac Observer sale now, especially that we're you know almost a year out from it. I have a little more perspective and uh, I've been able to I've, I've learned how to process it and talk more about some of those details. So I'm, so I'm happy to do that. Do you have any thoughts, Shannon, or do you, like, do you want to? No, I, and I, I, I can address some of the specifics of this as well mm. uh, and offer up some tips. Cause I've, you know, we've been through this a couple of times in a couple of different ways. Yeah. And, uh, and then been, been a part of it 
where it didn't work out, you know, when you were almost to, to the altar. So that, yeah, we definitely can offer some more <laughs> specifics and, and thanks for pointing it out, Jeff. Uh, and we can do that now. Yeah. I would, I would say, you know, cause yeah, this year I've, I've gone through it with a different business where we, we did get not all the way to the altar, but you know, far enough along that it looked like things were moving and then, and then they did not. And, uh, you know, but that's okay. We retrench yeah. and figured out, but that's part of it. So perhaps the very first piece of advice that I will give you when you think you might be selling your business is don't start thinking like you might be selling your business or certainly don't start acting that way. But more importantly, <laughs> don't start thinking that way because you don't want to emotionally detach from the business until after yes. the check clears. And this is so hard to do. I like I it is, it I know hard. logically you're all probably nodding your heads like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. It's hard to do. I, I went through it with Mac Observer last year uh, and it was a very that was a very quick deal. You know, we we started those conversations in September and the deal was done in December. That's pretty quick. Uh, we had, like I said, this other business that we knew not to emotionally detach from. And we didn't entirely. But in retrospect, we did sort of take our foot off the gas a little bit, assuming that, well, why would we want to start these new initiatives if if it's going to be somebody else's, you, you know, those kinds of things. It only was a couple of months that we did that. And then we're like, wait, wait, that's a mistake. You know, let's not let's not do that. And then my favorite example is uh, you and me, Shannon, with deals on the Web years and years ago. Yes. That one really did get to the altar. I mean, oh, we. It, yeah, that's yeah. right. And, and you and, <laughs> and I. And it, we're so like far that. removed from it on the day we realized it was still ours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that and it the killed. day after we were like, wait, what now? <laughs> what do we do now? Like we were supposed to get the check today and instead yeah. it's uh, we the were gone. same. But we, we, and we were done. We were done. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And the business suffered because, because of Dude, it. The it business died because yeah. of it. Yeah. It died. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it was a huge lesson. And that maybe where you know you you got that that takeaway from all those years ago oh for sure uh, not maybe you know <laughs> count, yeah. yeah counting the chick you know counting the eggs or whatever counting the chickens before the eggs hatch and, yeah, but it and, wasn't uh, even it, that we were we had spent the money that we never got no. right it was it was yeah. the the emotional detachment because it's hard yeah. here's the problem you know it, you create a business you put you know your heart your soul and your time into it you make sacrifices on behalf of the business it's yours there's probably going to be a period of time if you're anything like me where you don't even you can't even imagine selling the business you know that somebody yeah, else could run it like sure. it's impossible and and then you go through this process of well i've got to i've got to unravel my emotions from this thing and 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 then you do that successfully and find wait wait I'm still here, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, and it can, it can just put you in a bad position negotiation wise. Um, in terms of to, to, to get to the, some of the specifics that, that Jeff correctly accuses us of ignoring, which we've already done thus far, uh, in terms of vetting the buyer, you know, things to look out for, it, it's hard to offer too many specifics, but we've been through it a few times. So I, I think I can, I can I can do a couple of these. One is to make sure that they have the money that they say they have. Um, and if you're working with a, if your business is large enough, and when I say large enough, I would say something um, maybe above 3 million gross a year. And I would say that's sort of the, the bare minimum uh, if you're going to work with an M and a firm. And the reason I say that's a bare minimum is a, their markets sort of live in that realm and above, of course, but also you're going to be paying a sales commission, a pretty hefty one. It's kind of like a real estate transaction. So you're paying somewhere between, you know, four and 10%, let's say of the sales price. So you, you know, you want to make sure that um, you're, it's not just cutting into everything that you're going to get out of the business. Um, but if you're working with an M&A firm, they will often take care of that part of it for you and, and verify funds. But if they're not, um, or if you're working with a place like Empire Flippers or Flippa, right, which are other places to sell business, you go online, Empire Flippers, Flippa, um, there's website closers as well. If you have a website that you're selling, um, and they will vet buyers and they will, 
you know, require bank statements to show that they have the cash or, or a loan or something that they can, they can do. Uh, I did that with the buyer for the Mac observer last year. I, I went through that with him and, and he successfully proved that, yep, I've got, in fact, he started there. He sort of knew, look, I, I want you to know I'm serious. So I'm just going to show you, it, you know, the, the funds. And, and yeah. that, that was a good sign that, oh, wait a minute. That's sort of what pulled me off the fence of, of, th- of deciding to even engage with this guy. Cause you know, you get tire kickers every now and then, and you don't want to waste your time. Uh, but uh, there's that. And yeah. Yeah. I, yeah so that's one thing. Let me, let Certainly me, go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah. I want to address this. Like how the word specific question, you know, how did you find the buyer? Yeah. But I want to back up a little bit more. And, and I also, um, well, I, I think that it's important to get someone else's perspective about your business, whether it's, uh, you know, a partner, uh, in my case, it was, you know, my wife who worked for the company who told me, you know, you don't, they don't need you anymore. You know, your, your skill set is not (laughs) required at this business anymore. And I really didn't want to hear that, but, uh, and I, it, it was a really good jolt uh, to think about, okay, maybe I, maybe we should find somebody to take the business to another level and do something else. It was in maintenance mode and that's just not my specialty. Yeah. And it, it needed a better manager to take it to another level, a better, you know, the logistics, all that kind of stuff. But as far as where you find the buyer, the best buyers, in my opinion, find you uh, because they're already looking. It, it's like being at the dance and, not, you know, you want to be the, the, uh, I'll use this bad analogy, but like the hottest girl at the dance that everybody wants to ask to dance, right? You don't want to be desperate and chasing everybody all over the place. So, and it's not that you want to play hard to get, but you know, your value, the value of your business, it's provided for you. It's hopefully, you know, providing for employees and all this kind of stuff. And you can certainly put the word out to people. Oh yeah. You know, Hey, I might be interested. And, and now like, to Dave's point, if you're working with a, an M and A firm, that's that's a different story. They're going to go out and search and vet people, and that's that's awesome. But in the in the situations where I've sold businesses, I've had I feel like we had a better relationship because they wanted to buy me yeah. first before I reached out to them. It was an easy. I didn't have to pitch it as much, right? Um, because I, I mean, yeah, there was some pitching, and I had to do a lot of due diligence. Um, and I, I go back to more, part of the, and I don't know if it's in the E-Myth or another book that, that we've talked about, but there's a saying, you know, you want to run your business like you're going to sell it tomorrow. And that makes you more efficient. It makes your reporting better, your accounting better. And that helped me a lot. And I've had businesses that I've sold that the accounting wasn't so great and it took months to clean up to actually make a sale happen versus other ones that it was it was quick and easy uh, because we had, we'd kept on top of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, if you can, you know, go, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say yeah, the, the, it's certainly handy when a buyer comes to you, what you don't get the benefit of there is um, finding out if there is other interest in your business and, yes. and potentially getting a better price for it. However, y- you know, every business businesses are weird, right? It, it's, it's, I, I say it's like buying a house or selling a house and that's true, but most houses are built for in a, in standard ways, right? For people to live in. Okay, fine. You know, you might need three bedrooms. You might need two, but you're going to have bathrooms. You're going to have a kitchen. You're going to have a living room. You know, houses have a lot of common features that are just part of having a house, right? It's going to have heat, or it's going to have, you know, it's climate control of some part, some, some sort, if that's, you know, necessary in your area of the country, businesses are different. Every business is, you know, I hate to say every business is unique, but they are, and their businesses can be radically different from one another. So it's not quite as yeah. simple as finding someone who's looking for a house that wants to buy, you know, that decides your house is good enough. Most people that buy businesses are aren't going to choose your business because it's good enough. They're going to choose it because it's exactly what they want to buy. And if they don't. Yeah. And, and, it, and they have the skill set, right? right. It, it, something 
is, oh, are you in this industry? Are you part of a larger company that's buying smaller companies? Yeah. What, uh, what makes you yeah, interested, what, yes. but also like what makes, qualified. what makes you qualified <laughs> or confident? It, it's, it's yeah. less, I found it less about being qualified to run the business and more about being confident that they are qualified to run the business. So as, yes. as we were going through what I'll call the negotiation process of any of these businesses, the, and, and this goes all the way back to when you and I attempted to, to, or almost sold deals on the web, which it was a scenario where the buyer came to us. It was actually a public company, but it, you know, they, it was the same kind of thing. They came to us, knocked on the door cold on one afternoon and were like, Hey, are you for sale? You know, um, but it, it was that the negotiation process was as much proving the value of the business as it was proving how easy it's going to be for you, dear buyer, to take this business and and profit from it when you're running it in ways that maybe I couldn't even do right, you know, with with the business and that. It's a very interesting scenario to be in because it requires a little bit of humility. I mean, I, you know, I in, in many of these conversations, I correctly you don't want to lie to people because generally people can tell when you're lying. But I, I, you know, there are things that you wouldn't normally say in the course of running a business like, oh, yeah, I'm terrible at this part of it. But it sounds like you're much better at this part, like with Mac Observer, very specifically, SEO was something we never got right. But this guy that came in understood SEO. And he also understood that we had never gotten it right. And he realized that this might be a huge opportunity for him uh, to take this established property with huge domain authority and actually do some, some legitimate SEO with it and really grow it pretty quickly. And as soon as I realized that I, I you know, to myself, I, I thought, wow, he's right, you know, but it takes a lot to admit that. However, in the sales process, admitting that's important because if I told them, no, 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 you're wrong. SEO is never going to help this business. It doesn't matter. Well, I might have talked myself out of selling or talked him out of buying the business, right? <laughs> like, you know, yeah, I, I sure. had to kind of go with it. Like, yeah, you're right. We are terrible at that. You seem to be better. You believe that you're better if you run with that. And that became a huge part of our conversations. Like, yeah, here are things we've noticed over the years that we probably should have done, but never took action on. We did other things instead. And let me tell you about those two, but it wasn't, it was more about talking up the business than it was talking up me. Cause I didn't want to be hired by this yeah, person. You, that bought yeah, the that's business, correct. Right. That's you know? a weakness. If, if yes. all this stuff revolves around you as the owner, that's, that's a weakness. That's a huge problem. Yeah. Yeah. What you want to promote is your systems, right? Yes. The systems your, that your, they can inherit. That's correct. Right. Yeah. And manage and perhaps manage better. Yep. And you know, your your database, your proprietary software, your website, your workflow. I mean, you know, the managers, your supervisors, right. all those right. systems that you've, you know, uh put your blood, sweat, and tears into developing all the time. That is what attracts buyers, and that's what makes your company um, worth more. Because but don't make it take seem it. like you're such a master that you're the oh, no. only human on the planet that could have created those systems, right? You just want to, yeah. You want to say, look, we've tried a bunch of different things, and here's what we've learned. You get to buy the result of that, those experiments, right? Lots of mistakes were made. A few good decisions, you know, were made along the way. You now know that that's what you're buying. Here's a business that's profitable. Obviously, you want to show them the books. You have to do that. But but yeah, keeping your ego out of it, uh, I found to be hugely valuable. And because I don't yeah. need them to respect my business acumen. I just need them to to sign the check at that point. I mean, it, you yeah. know, it's right. like that's just the reality of it. Like you said, you're not selling yourself unless, unless you are. You know, if you're trying to do an aqua hire, that's a whole different thing. Aqua hire is where somebody buys yeah. a business really just to to shut down or not shut down, but maybe shut down your business and and then bring you on board. And that that happens too. It happens all the time. In fact, if you're an iPhone user, uh, the shortcuts app that's on your iPhone started as an app that two guys wrote called Workflow, and Apple aqua hired them brought them in because they really liked what they were doing. And now they do that same thing for Apple, um, yeah. you know, and they call it shortcuts. So like 
if there's nothing wrong with that, but just know what you're selling and make sure that your actions are in line with what you're selling. So that, that would be another. Yeah. yeah. And, and I also like the comment about vetting the buyer, because, you know, if you're like most small business owners, you, you care about the people that work for you and you want them to succeed as well, right? With this new venture. And part of the uh, process of selling the company is selling the people that are going to be there yes. on this new owner, if they're going to stay there. And if they're, well, they're part the of your system. I don't, I don't yeah. mean to say that it callously, but you know, oh. that's one of the things, if someone's buying a business that's profitable, there's, and there's employees, they probably will want those employees to stay because that's, yes. that's, that's part of the system that they're buying. And so, yeah, it needs to be the right person. Yeah. And you want to, you need to be comfortable presenting it to, to these people that, Hey, this is the reason I'm doing it. Yeah. Uh, you know, this person could take it to another level or solve this problem or what, you know, whatever it is. Um, the, the last couple of things that I, I would say is you, you need to, uh, uh, well, a few things. One is on your financials. You, you have to be, uh, get some help restating your financials. And, and that sounds weird, but that, that's a really important aspect of this. It's not, because che it's not cheating. <laughs> yeah. It's not cheating. And if you've been listening to Business Brain, you know, for the last 408 episodes, you know that we are big fans of expensing much of your lifestyle through your business, which is legal. And, and uh, you know, you, you should do that. It's, another, it's a huge benefit. When you restate your earnings, you want to pull out all those things and so, okay, well, if we hadn't done this and didn't hold our board meeting in uh, Belize, Belize or wherever, <laughs> wherever it was, uh, then it would, you know, your books will look different. So that's really important. The and, other part is your- well, and, that, and that's the, the thing that I learned a term in the last year uh, called SDE or seller's discretionary earnings. And oftentimes your entire salary- falls into that column. And then, you know, if you have a company car that might fall into that column, it, you know, like you yep. said, your, your trip to your board meeting in Belize, some of the added added stuff that you might do while you're traveling that as far as the IRS is concerned are legitimate business expenses, but your new owner, your buyer wouldn't necessarily have to make those, ex those expenses you know, to or make those purchases to run the business, all of those things. Right. It's a known thing and it's totally accepted that, you know, and and, and the way I did it with Mac Observer, because it really was just me and and the buyer doing this, this negotiating. Uh, there was no middleman. We didn't use an M&A firm. We barely used attorneys uh, was I showed him the the books and then I showed him the restated books and I explained why. The books, he That's wasn't perfect. quite yeah. as savvy on the terms. And so I, I had to, I had to walk him through this a little bit. It would have been easier if he had his own attorney to, to be, to be brutally frank. And if you are going down this path, I highly recommend having your own attorney. Um, and I, I strongly encourage you to convince the other party, the buyer to have theirs because Oh, him, yeah. him yeah. not having an attorney almost killed this deal because there were things that my attorney was, was advising me to do. I, I, you know, I'd been down this path in different ways, but there were parts of it that were new to me too. But my attorney was someone I was paying so that I could in theory, trust them. And, and I did, I chose to trust him, you know, but he explained certain things to me that were they not explained to me would have potentially made me, were they not explained to me by my attorney who I trust by default, if they were explained to me by the buyer, I would have filtered them with, well, is this a negotiation tactic or is this just something that normally happens? And I know the reverse was happening and it, it almost yeah. killed the deal because he didn't have someone in his corner that could say, no, no, no. Hey, whoa, whoa. Don't freak out. Like this is, this is normal. What, what we're, what you're seeing here is absolutely par for the course don't sweat it. This is this. Everything's still fine. I know this seems weird, but it's only because you haven't done this before. Right. You know, having someone in your court that knows the the procedures and can can have those conversations can can save the deal. Attorneys can also kill the deal. But, you know, you, you have to. The conversation I had with my attorney when I brought him on board to do this, this deal was, uh, hey, look, I, I need you to tell me everything that you you, you think I need to know to protect myself. And I also need you to be okay knowing that I'm only going to 
uh, go along with about 60 percent of it. Uh, because there's going to be parts of it that I'm just going to choose. Yep, I'm going to ignore your advice here. I'm going to plow forward, and it's going to be okay. And you got to you got to be okay with that uh, for us to work together. And if you are, then great. But please, just because I'm ignoring 40 percent of your advice, don't cut your advice down by 40 percent. Give me 100 percent. Know that I'm only going to take 40. And if there's one that I choose not to take, and you think it's a really bad idea, say so. Totally fine. I take no offense at that. You know. Yeah, and, and it's a great topic. Uh, we could talk, you know, for hours on uh -huh. this because it is important. You, the other thing you can do is if you go to uh, businessbrain.show and just search for the term selling, you'll you'll find uh, four or five shows where we talked more in depth about selling your business, uh, and and so you may find some helpful things there. The the last couple little quick things is think about your story. That's really important when you're talking to a buyer. What what's what is the story of your business that you've built this thing around? Uh, and then at the same time, uh, I want to make one comment about financing is think about, okay, am I going to require somebody to write one big check or am I selling maybe to a smaller Sell smaller buyer that needs to finance those things. Really important topics to to think about beforehand because they can derail uh, your deal. So, so go up businessbrain.show, search for the term selling, and uh, you can pick up more more help on this topic. Yeah, there you go. Fun stuff. Good question. If there are, you know, we're 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 ending this segment here because we've been at we're at like forty seven minutes almost uh, on the show. If there are specifics that you want to know, good news. We're going to do this again next week. Feedback at businessbrain.show. I'd love to hear from you so that we know what specifics you want to know. And, and we're here to help. And if you've got something else, also feedback at businessbrain.show. Love to hear from you. You got anything else before we uh, pull the ripcord on this one, man? No, that's it. It's exciting stuff. I love talking about selling your business. It's a great opportunity. It it can be. Uh, you know, you got to be okay with the process, and you got to be okay with the eventual outcome too. But yes, yeah. it can be for sure. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Keep living that charmed life, and we'll see you next week.